Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Ahead of the Curve, a speaker series from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. My name is Du Bois Bowman, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the School of Public Health. This Ahead of the Curve speaker series focuses on conversations about leadership, and throughout the series, we have discussions with contemporary leaders to hear about their insights, their vision, their stories of perseverance. Leadership is a critical component of navigating complex health challenges and building a better future through improved health and equity. We want to hear about the important factors that shape great leaders, and we want to learn how they continue to evolve and grow. And we do this so that we can help to train the next generation of leaders. We have a fantastic guest with us today to explore these issues. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Bakari Sellers, a civil rights activist, attorney and author. Bakari was born into an activist family. He's followed in the footsteps of his father, civil rights leader, Dr. Cleveland Sellers, and his tireless commitment to public service while being a champion of progressive policies that address issues ranging from education and poverty to preventing domestic violence and childhood obesity. Bakari made history in 2006 when at the young age of 22, he became the youngest member of the South Carolina State Legislature and the youngest African-American elected official in the nation. In 2014, Sellers won the Democratic nomination for Lieutenant Governor in South Carolina. Sellers is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, My Vanishing Country, a memoir, which illustrates the lives of America's forgotten black working class men and women. He's also written a children's book entitled, Who Are Your People? Bakari currently practices law with the Strom Law Firm, where he leads the firm's strategic communication and public affairs team, and has recently added diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting to the list of services offered. He is also a prominent political contributor for CNN. Bakari, thank you for joining us today. I'm really, really excited to have you here and looking forward to our conversation. So if you're ready, uh, we can go ahead and dive right into questions. Let's dive right in. All right. Terrific. So let's start. What I want to do is just start with your background sure. uh, and uh, just your time growing up. And your book, My Vanishing Country, gets into this quite a bit. You write about growing up in the rural South and your father's legacy of activism in the civil rights movement. And so can you tell us a little bit about these experiences and how the experiences helped to shape you and your values today? So first, I'm from the big city of Denmark, South Carolina, where we have three stoplights and a blinking light. And my mom and dad would always say that the two most important words in the English language are the words thank you. Um, and they're not nearly said enough. And so first, let me say thank you for uh, the University of Michigan um, inviting me, the School of Public Health inviting me. Uh, du Bois, thank you so much uh, for uh, it having me here and, and doing your best Don Lemon impersonation uh, <laughs> as we uh, navigate this conversation. Um, I'm also a product of the proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And so my village was decently unique. My father was one of the founding members of a small fledgling civil rights organization known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. They got paid $8 a week um, to go into places like Philadelphia, Mississippi and register voters, particularly during Freedom Summer. Um, you know, I, I grew up with the aunts and uncles of the movement, the Julian Bonds, Marion Berries, Kathleen Cleavers. Um, you know, it's for me, um, it, it's, uh, it was a unique experience being able to grow up and not have to read about our history and our history books, but actually be able to talk to people who experienced the jailhouse floors and, and the smell of gun smoke. Um, uh, my father's story, as you, as you alluded to, is somewhat unique in that um, he was in prison not once but twice. My father went to prison for uh, not going to the Vietnam uh, draft, Vietnam War draft, and he also um, was uh, incarcerated for the events of February 8th, 1968. Many people know about Kent State uh, to a lesser degree. Some people know about Jackson State, but very people know about very few people know about South Carolina State, where three young students were killed and another 27 were wounded by South Carolina State troopers who fired shots into the group of students after they protested. Uh, my dad was actually there that night, helped organize the protest. He was shot. They knew him to be a member of SNCC and they deemed him to be an outside agitator. Um, and so he actually spent time on death row because his bond was denied. He was charged, tried and convicted of rioting. He became the first and only one man riot in the history of the country. 
Um, and so, um, you know, that is a part of my story. That's a part of who I am. That's what I bring to the practice of law where I do civil rights work. But one of the things that I always mention and that people sometimes don't include in my introduction is that my two most amazing tasks are um, number one, uh, being a husband and number one, B, um, I'm being a father um, to my wife, Ellen, and my kids, Sadie Stokely um, and Kai. So again, just just thank you for having me. And I am look forward to to talk about some of these issues that are near and dear to my heart and try to unravel what King um, talked about in the book of how far have we come and where do we go from here? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm in awe as you're describing your upbringing and uh, really the access that you had to such phenomenal leaders, including your father. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get to your college years in a moment, but you know that's a place where many students will get an introduction uh, and exposure to prominent leaders, but you actually grew up with it uh, surrounding you. And, and I'm wondering as a, you know, a young man growing up, did you uh, view it as a responsibility, as a commitment? Were there expectations that you would follow in your father's footsteps? Uh, describe to me what that was like. Yeah, I don't know about follow in his footsteps, but there was a expectation. Um, um, and, you know, it wasn't a difficult shadow. My, my mom and dad both taught my brother, my sister and I that we could be anything in the world we wanted to be as long as we were change agents. Um, and that was the, the that was the phrase that's used in our home. That's the phrase I use with my children. Look, you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a minister, a businessman, a, you know, a psychiatrist, a podiatrist, you can be a veterinarian, whatever you want to be. But as long as you are in that field or choose that career path, lift while you climb and also be a change agent, that's fine. There was never a, you know, you need to do the same things that your father did when he did it. But there was also an obligation that my brother, sister and I felt um, for our community um, that was instilled in us from our, our childhood, you know, that's not everybody's ministry. I mean, if you want to own two Teslas and live in a gated neighborhood and, and not, you know, care too much about anything else other than your own and your own family, I think that there is a, a certain right, inherent right to, to live that life. Um, in, but for me, it's about putting my shoulder to the wheel and trying to see if I can help change the world. I mean, that's kind of the goal is, as as um, uh, colloquial as that may sound, but you, that is something that we try to do on a daily basis. Terrific, terrific. Uh, so let's move ahead now again to your college experience. And mm -hmm. you began your undergraduate studies at Morehouse College when you were 16 years old. And for the audience, a disclaimer, I am also an alumnus of Morehouse College. And so I'm in awe you know, of thinking about Bakari uh, beginning his studies at the young age of, of 16. And so while you were at Morehouse, you were active in student government. You wrote about how you experienced your first political campaigns while running for student government positions. What did those early experiences at Morehouse teach you about politics? Well, I'm glad you you added a caveat about politics. Morehouse was an uh, was an amazing experience, the best four years of my life. Like you said, I went to I went there when I was 16 years old. Um, my weekend started on Thursday and I, I had this unique skill, I believe it was a hell of an accomplishment. I lost my academic scholarship not once, but twice. Do you guys know how difficult that actually is? Um, but, you know, I just, I, you know, my parents weren't too concerned about um, me navigating um, college. It, it was it was so dope because um, in Atlanta, you could get into any bar or any club you wanted to at a college ID. So I was in Buckhead at 16, like partying with Sierra and you know, back then it was Jermaine Dupri and everybody. I mean, it was it was nuts. And I enjoyed every single minute of it um, almost too much. But, um, you know, as you go through it at Morehouse, one of the things you learn is that they treat, um, you know, our our uh, our SJ president is like J.J. McCarthy to give a, an analogy. Um, and that's your quarterback. I didn't make that. Yes, name up. yes, yes. <laughs> didn't he just declare he used to be your quarterback? So, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, and so, you know, it, it's that level of leadership is valued and appreciated at Morehouse. Uh, they, they have a, a belief that they place a crown above your head for you to grow into. Um, and leadership is a value that is, that is taught and, and honed and drilled upon. And so, um, when I was in student government, I was junior class president, SGA president, um, just trying to make sure that I took my leadership outside of the gates of the campus, be remembered for something. Um, and it actually proved to be helpful. I started plotting my 
run for the South Carolina State House of Representatives when I was 17, 18 years old on the campus of Morehouse College. Wow. Wow. That's remarkable. And and so, you know, thinking about the experience at Morehouse, and you also wrote about this, that that uh, Morehouse is a college bred on leadership. And it was that, you know, leadership is not being someone who has followers or right. even someone, you know, exuding uh um, you know, maximum charisma, but instead at, at, that a leader is someone who begets other leaders. And so right. can you talk more about that and, and what you learned about leadership even during your time at Morehouse? Yeah, no, I think the way that we, and I think the way that a lot of institutions actually, this is not an indictment of you, this is probably an overgeneralization, but the way that we teach leadership is decently perverted in this country. We denote leaders by how many followers, or how many parishioners they have, uh, how many churchgoers they have, how many Instagram followers or you know, how many views or likes or clicks they have. And that that's really not the way or, or should not be the way and, and truly is just not the definition of leadership. Um, you know, I, I, I think people uh, uh, in, would inherently see value in um, whether or not you have a thousand parishioners or followers or not um, is not the same as having three other individuals who can go out and lead themselves. And so leadership begets other leaders. And that should be the way that it's defined and taught. That's also a value that um, is is learned at, at, at school and particularly in institutions such as yours. And I would also go to say it also helps you look at people and treat dif people differently. I have a problem with the way we treat people today, particularly those individuals who we may not see. And what I mean by may not see is not that we are blind to them um, literally, but they're the individuals who, um, you know, serve us our meals in the cafeteria or clean up after us. They're the people who are doormen, who are janitors, who make our daily task um, that much easier. The fact that we don't acknowledge them or speak or acknowledge their existence. I think that if you were to pour into those people, um, as you would expect someone to pour into you, you'll be surprised the leadership characteristics that those individuals have and how you can breed and cultivate a nexus of leadership. And again, the still King, I don't know why I'm quoting King so much. I actually hate that, but you'll be, you'll find yourself kind of tied in a, in a single garment of destiny or network of mutuality. So I'd like to expand on, uh, you know, your, your, that last point you made, I like to expand on that a little bit and thinking about our students, you know, our, we try to uh, teach our students, uh, during doing their undergraduate and graduate training in public health, a bit about leadership. Uh, so many people view leadership as positional, right? You, you kind of wait until you get to a certain position to begin to lead. Uh, you actually had positional leadership at young ages, but you also, you know, just even from your remarks thus far uh, in our conversation, you know, you were doing things that reflected leadership along the way, well before you reached those positions. And so I want to, you know, just ask you maybe to elaborate on that a bit, you know, in, in, in particular with some of our students in mind. And I think, I think the rigidity that was leadership is, is, is kind of, is, is dwindling away. You know, there was the rigidity that said that you had to be this or you had to be that in order to be there to be some leadership connotation associated with who you are and that's not the case anymore i think the social media and and friedman actually uh thomas friedman i'm not a big friedman supporter but he did write the the, the world is flat um and the he, the thesis is fundamentally correct because it is flat and we're all kind of in this new era of social media um, if you think about it, um, you know, we are, we are so interconnected, uh, that the world is fundamentally flat, right? You're no longer, not like Kyrie Irving, like you're going to fall off the edge of it, but <laughs> like, it's fundamentally flat. Like, for example, if you graduate from the university of Michigan, you're no longer just compa can, competing with somebody who graduates in Ohio. You're not competing with people who graduate in the UAE in London, et cetera, because fundamentally the world is now flat due to our interconnectivity. And so when you think about that and in, in, in the, the realm of of leadership what you understand now is that those rigid definitions that you have to be executive this or you have to be president of this have fallen by the wayside because there's so much that this new generation generation z which by the way is a horrible generational name they should come up with something else but generation z has the the entire wealth of knowledge uh, in of the world at their fingertips and so they themselves, without those titles, are able to mold, manipulate in some ops, in some instances what the future will look like. Absolutely. All right. So so 
you started Morehouse when you were 16. Uh, I don't know exactly your birth month, but let's say roughly 20 when you graduate. Yeah, I was 21. Uh, yes. Yep. And so at at 21 years old, you announced your candidacy for the South Carolina House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. And you were running against a 26 year incumbent. So an incumbent who had served in the state house for longer than you had been alive at that point. What compelled you to run for office? And tell me just what that experience was like for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I had thought about it my junior and senior year. I worked for Jim Clyburn my my sophomore year. I actually, the summer of my freshman year, I worked for Jim Clyburn in, in Congress. I interned for him. Then uh, uh, the summer of my junior year, I worked for Shirley Franklin, who was the mayor of Atlanta. And I got this bug where they taught me that it wasn't really politics, but public service. Politics is the science of it, understanding it, the gamesmanship, but the public service is the reason why we really do it. Um, and it was just, it was refreshing to see and learn from them. And I kind of got this bug to, um, to do it. And so um, I plotted with my good friend, Jared Lodehout, um, who is now a, a lawyer and lobbyist at um, Ice Miller. Um, he's, he lives in Atlanta, but he's based out of DC. Um, and we um, said that, you know, we're gonna, we pulled the numbers, we looked at it, we're gonna run against Thomas Road. Thomas was in the state house, before he was in the state house, he was on the county council before he was on the county council he delivered the mail and before he delivered the mail he delivered the milk so he knew everybody in the county great 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 guy um the, but the the district wasn't growing even stagnantly it was declining and so um it was my home i went back home i got accepted into harvard emory and the university of south carolina for law school um i, I accept i i chose the university of south carolina because i wanted to run for the state house i i ran um I announced September 18th of 2005, although that I had already been planning and, and spoken to people about that and laid the groundwork and, you know, spoke, spoken to other electeds and some, some money folk, although only raised, I think, $26,000 for that race. Um, and uh, on June 13th, 2006, we beat them with 55% of the vote and, um, you know, made history as being in the youngest um, in the history of South Carolina and the youngest black elected official in the country at the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, re remarkable aspiration and being able to follow through and execute uh, to uh, deliver that result. And so, you know, you find yourself now, uh, uh, you know, part of the, the state legislature. Uh, you're still a really young man, right? And so uh, how was it like uh, being a lot like significantly younger than your colleagues? And how did that impact your the approach to your work or maybe even how you were, were received in the state in the South Carolina legislature? So I, it wasn't as difficult as some may imagine. So so there were two things. The, the first is people, particularly some other black folk, gave me some level of a pass because of my father's history in the state. Okay. And they knew my last name. And I was I was like I was Cleves boy. I was yep. a little CL. So I, I, I acknowledge that like it was a level of bias or prejudice or whatever that benefited me. I acknowledge yep. that coming in. My family was well known. And so they, um, you know, they treated me and gave me that that level of decency and respect that, I, that another 21 year old, a 22 year old may not have gotten. But I was also just way more prepared than anybody. And I also I took value in, in that um, in pride in that in that preparation, because I, I realized that I was young. I was black. I was a Democrat. And then I was a young black Democrat. So I had to be that much more prepared than anybody else up there. And so my, my pre preparation routine for my day was and still is decently insane in terms of the the information i consume you know the newspapers the national newspapers yes people still read newspapers <laughs> um you know the the long form articles the atlantic things like that just surrounding myself with brilliant people like jason johnson or michael harriet or van newkirk or uh you know um adam sora or um um uh what's I can't even remember Wes's last name right now, Wesley Lowry. I mean, just people who are in my orbit who, you know, do good work um, and are brilliant and smarter than I. I mean, I just surround my people with surround myself with those people so that um, maybe through osmosis or maybe just through inquisitiveness, I'm able to assume and, and learn some things. And, and one of the things I would just tell anybody is you got to. That one of the common things I found with everybody who's attained some level of success is that they all have this insatiable desire to learn as much as possible. And you have to have that. As soon as you stop wanting to learn, you're dying. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So the so the 
I want to tap into a, a, another thing that you exude, and that's confidence. Uh, and you know, people can go, draw confidence from many places. Uh, you know, I would also say your college experience is one that instills confidence uh, in uh, many young men. The but I but it, I I, I want to ask just the question, given the diligent preparation and meticulous preparation that you mentioned, uh, that is a part of your approach to your work, uh, you know, and that that you take that seriously, how, you know, how much does that uh, help to instill confidence as you, you know, approach various endeavors? Yeah, I, I you know, um, people joke about my humility, or in some cases, like they're, uh, I mean, my confidence has to do a lot of with the fact that I'm young, and I got in this thing really, really young. Um, and when you when you were young, you had this sense of invincibility. You know, you think you, there's nothing you can't do. There's no obstacle you can't overcome. Sometimes that leads to stupid mistakes, which I've made my fair share of. And sometimes that leads to you just being on top of the mountain and people wanting to know how you got there. And your response is because why not? I mean, somebody should have done this already. And so, you know, I think that, you know, half the battle is preparation, appearance, um, believing in yourself. I mean, hell, if I don't believe in myself, who will? Um, understanding that there's no, I mean, my, my anxiety, um, it helps to conform my thought process a lot, um, because I live in 24 hour increments. Um, I'm not the best person to ask, where will I be in five years? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I try to win days. I think a lot of people try to, um, consume the elephant hole or tackle their goals in one fell swoop. And for me, I just... I um, deal with one one day at a time. And, um, you know, uh, Will Smith once said that um, if you have enough good effing days, you have a good effing life. And so I figure that if I want enough days, like I, I want to just, you know, I want to win six out of every 10 days. So if I can, you know, if you go, if you bat 600, you're going to, you're going to the majors, you're going to Hall of Fame, really. If you complete 60% of your passes, you're not doing bad. You know, if you shoot 60% from the field, You'll take that any day of the week. And so that's what I try to do is, is win as many days as I can. And if I focus on the task at hand, it, it, it helps me live my life to the fullest. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think there's great uh, advice and insights as I think about uh, members of our audience, our students uh, who you know are still at a stage where they're establishing their foundation, but they're really trying to figure out the next steps uh, toward, toward their future. So uh, you know, now we'll, we'll move forward to 2014. You decided to give mm -hmm. up your seat in the state legislature to run for lieutenant governor of South Carolina. The last time an African-American was elected to a statewide political office in South Carolina was in 1876. And in talking about the issues that motivated you to run, yeah, you commented on several things, One, things such as children attending schools that were dilapidated and falling apart, uh, local hospitals closing, people traveling hours a day for low paying jobs and residents in some places drinking water unfit for human consumption. And as I think about that list, those are all things that I regard as core drivers of public health issues. And at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, we were fortunate in the spring to have the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, as our graduation speaker. And when he talked to our graduates, one of the things he talked about uh, was that, you know, when you deal with these kind of issues that we often hear people say things like, oh, stay in your lane. You know, if this isn't public health, these are political issues or other kinds of issues, and you should stay out of them. And I wonder along your path, if you've had similar experiences where people have signaled to you uh, on whatever issues to stay in your lane? And, you know, if so, how do you respond and make it clear that the issues that you're addressing are in your lane? Yeah, one, I don't care. So that that is probably a very flippant but real answer to other people's concerns about what my lane looks like and direction it's going in. But two, I mean, I, I think that there is a great deal of value in beginning to learn how to think critically and peeling back the layers of the onion so that you can see the secondary and even tertiary uh, uh, symptoms that can help you define what the cancer or cause of that cancer is. I mean, I think um, the best the best example I can give you is COVID. And, and please, I, I'm speaking to the School of Public Health, so I don't want to bore you with things you already know. But um, in my conversations, particularly on TV with individuals who 
um, you know, want to deduce or understand why <clears throat> black folk or Native Americans are um, are dying at higher rates and more predisposed to to having severe reactions to COVID. Um, for me, it, we actually missed an opportunity. Actually, Michigan did it extremely well. Shout out to Gretchen and my big Gretchen, as we call her in the CNN studios, <laughs> and my good friend Garland Gilchrist, who ran your COVID task force. Um, I actually write about this in my new book, The Moment, coming out um, April 23rd, shameless plug. But I, um, I, I um, began to think that we missed that opportunity to truly see, because COVID ripped the Band-Aids off the inequities in our respective communities. For example, um, you know, I grew up in what's called a food desert, where I'm not sure the USDA definition today, but it was where I think at one point it was two miles where you can't travel two miles and get access to fresh fruits and vegetables. That was considered a food desert. And so what does that mean? It means that many times you go in and you're eating processed meats or um, you're getting, um, you know, 10 packets of Kool-Aid for, um, you know, 99 cent or a dollar. Uh, they, were, they were 10 for a dollar. And then you get a, a dollar and 10 cent bag of sugar. Right. And you put two two cups of sugar in there and one packet. If you if you feel freaky, you put cherry and lemonade in the in the cooler together and you have cherry lemonade Kool-Aid. Right. And that, you know, you drink that consistently, you end up with the sugar, as we call it. Right. Or, or diabetes or the processed meats and the, the salt and all of the salt intake and all of those things lead to um, um, lead to preventable illnesses such as cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And so you combine that with the fact that uh, many times you have these communities, um, black folk and otherwise, who are um, in, in, in places where their um, environmental injustices are just wreaking havoc. Um, where they are near brownfields, for example, or inhaling dirty uh, or unclean air, or even worse, drinking unclean water, which was where I grew up, Denmark, South Carolina. Um, so you have the food desert combined with the environmental injustices, and you throw on top of that a lack of access to care. So you're not getting the preventive treatment you need. I, I didn't have a hospital in my community. So when you when you fall down or whatever it may be, you got to go 35, 45 minutes away. But that also means you don't really have... Um, you don't really have uh, OBGYNs um, in every county. Um, you can't really get the preventive medicine that you need. And, and coupled with that, the working poor fall in this gap or did until Obamacare fall in this gap where you can't even afford insurance. And so you think about all of these um, kind of social layers, uh, if I may, of, of environmental injustice, um, poverty, and lack of access to quality care, and you overlay a virus then it's it's really it makes more sense as to why you have these two groups of individuals, which are Native Americans and black folk, which are dying at higher rates than their counterpart. We did not actually have those discussions as we should have with the depth and necessity and urgency and intentionality and purposefulness um, to um, really take that time to address those ills, direct funds to those ills. And part of it is this. And this is this is my own framework of thinking people can push back or think something else. But like, <clears throat> I don't think I think politically we have two phrases which are perverted. And I think one is colorblindness. Like, I don't see race. I think that's silly. And the other is rising tides lift all boats. Um, you can't have race neutral policy proposals that directly affect and address race specific problems. Um, the best example I can give you of that is like PPP. PPP was like, here, y'all go get it. And what you realize is that the, 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 the companies and businesses that were affected the hardest hit were black businesses, particularly black women owned businesses, um, again, Hispanic businesses, Native American businesses. And what do you realize about that is that many of those individuals are unbanked, like they literally don't have bank accounts or access to capital. And so that policy proposal, good in nature, does not um, necessarily address the problems. And so um, I, I think COVID was a great example of policy failures and a lack of intentionality um, and a missed opportunity when we had it to address many of the systemic ills that that affect and plague our communities. Yeah, no, absolutely. My, my hope is that it will bring um, a tangible example that creates some lasting understanding, right? So uh, you mentioned many of those uh, just societal drivers that you throw on top of it, uh, you know, 
a highly contagious infectious disease. And we say it, we see it play out uh, in ways where we have uh, a disproportionate impact on certain communities. Uh, but those same fault lines, if you will, in society uh, give rise to other chronic illnesses, right? Yeah. And things like cancer, things like diabetes, uh, heart disease. And so those are the things that we address in public health. Um, you know, so it was no surprise to the public health community when we began to see uh, the inequities play out with with COVID. But my hope is that it, you know, uh, more broadly for society, it is a moment that we can point to uh, just to illustrate the the importance of addressing those upstream issues if we are going to try to achieve equity and help. Yes, but you started the word and that word did a lot of heavy lifting, which was hope. And I think it's in the book of James, which said that faith without works is dead. And we got a lot of good, hopeful people and a lot of good, well-intentioned people in D.C. and in state capitals around the country. But we we have not been able to fulfill or the check that is written to many of us from this country, this great, the greatest country in the land. I mean, it's been marked with insufficient, insufficient funds. So we have to we have to begin to really fundamentally tackle these issues or or. You know, poverty is a driving factor of death. That literally makes no sense. The number one cause in South Carolina for children underperforming in schools is hunger. Like, it's just the, the ridiculousness of me even having to articulate that um, is 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 mind boggling for the greatest country in the world. And so let's let's figure out how to be hopeful, but also be intentional. Absolutely. Absolutely. So and we need contributions uh in many different places uh one place that i'll uh, point attention to now is um you know policy and you know advocacy is a key part of our work in the field of public health it is important for us to be able to work with lawmakers so we can use our expertise and provide evidence just to influence policy in ways that benefit uh the health and well-being for communities uh, we try to teach our students this. Uh, mm -hmm. What advice would you give to the young advocates listening? And then how can we best grow their advocacy skills uh, and learn to work effectively with policymakers? Well, first is, is be fearless. I think that there is not much difference between the advocacy work that you're doing or being an advocate and the politician or elected official across the table from you. Um, and, you know, we, <laughs> you know, black, white, Democrat, Republican, from whatever part of the country or world you are from, um, we need more people like you running for office. And so I would I would say that you don't just have to be an advocate if you graduate from uh, the Michigan or University of Michigan School of Public Health. I think that you can um, also be the person making those decisions. And we need more smart people on all sides of the aisle, to be frank and honest. And so uh, I would I would also say be very clear, be very concise. Some of y'all talk too much um be very concise um some of y'all talk too much and don't listen enough uh be, you know be be able to articulate your data points bring data the best data though is a human being the best data is a human story a lot of times we get caught bogged down in the minutia of whatever the formula may be um and that's cool and necessary in certain instances but sometimes i just instead of talking about the data point of breast cancer i want you i want you to bring in and say this is my aunt. She's battling breast cancer right now. This is my nephew or niece who just lost his mom to breast cancer. Let me tell you what it would let him tell you what it was like the last two or three days of, of, of their life. And then also he'll tell you that he doesn't ever remember his mom being able to go get a, a mammogram. And why? Oh, we just didn't have any doctors in our community. Let's have those conversations and let's figure out ways in which we can communicate with people. And look, we don't talk to people enough. Uh, there, there are a couple of things we don't do. I mean, I've, I've figured out the world's problems. I mean, that's why you guys brought me here, right? I have literally <laughs> figured it out. Like, we don't have enough empathy in the world. We don't talk to each other enough. And we don't read enough books. Like, that's it. I think if we did those three things, we'd be all right. But, you know, for me, I, I, would, I would say that, you know, there is the way we communicate with people who are not. We live in silos. And that's part of, I think, I, I would believe this is something that is studied in public health or, or sociology or all of the things above, but we live in silos. So people literally only receive information and talk to people who have thoughts and ideas like their own. 
I mean, it's terrible. Um, and then we don't know how to have communications that are not McDonaldized or like really quick or, or 280 characters or whatever it is on X now. Um, we, we're used to sending DMs instead of having honest conversations with each other. And it's never good when you start the conversation on like, so tell me, tell me what your view is on abortion. I mean, usually the conversation should start with how your family, how your kids, let me get to know you. Let's go have a beer. Let's, you know, we have to get back to that. That is what's called true advocacy, knowing the person that you're, that you are appealing to and seeing what level of success you can have to get them where they need to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, in addition to uh, policy makers, the in public health, a really important uh, partner uh, communities. And so we do lots of community engaged work uh, that uh, gives community partners an equal seat at the table and generation of ideas and development of interventions and implementation, et cetera. And that's something that I think we have to, to continue to do. So you've touched on a few uh, public health uh, issues just in our in our conversation. You introduced COVID. I want to I want to drill down into a few more. So your father, uh, you have three children and your two youngest are twins who were born in 2019. You've spoken quite a bit about your wife, Ellen's experience giving birth. And you know, both of you have spoken about how Ellen almost lost her life due to complications from childbirth. We know that black women are three times more likely to die during childbirth than white women. Mm -hmm. This is a critical public health issue that one that you've been a passionate advocate for. And so as a as a father, as a lawmaker, as a major media contributor, contributor, what is it that you want people to know about this persistent issue and why is it important for us to prioritize it as a society? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I always tell people my number one political issue, people will look at you and assume they know what that is. But my number one political issue is actually African-American female mortality. The most unique thing about African-American female mortality are the fact that black women die at three times the rate of their white counterparts is that it, cro it cuts across socioeconomic levels. So it doesn't matter whether or not you are Serena Williams or Ellen Sellers. Um, or on Medicaid, the likelihood that you'll die is still great. Um, my wife, actually, so I, I have three unique experiences with the healthcare delivery system in this country. One is as a lawmaker and just as a citizen not having access to care. We didn't expand Medicaid in 2010, which was a terrible political decision made by many Southern governors. Um, and that actually limited the, the, the rural hospitals begin to shut down, et cetera, et cetera. And so you um you you realize that the access to care is is a very huge issue so that's one two of course african-american female mortality with my wife almost dying um, she gave birth to sadie and stokely at 5 28 and 5 33 p.m um, by 11 o'clock she had passed out while breastfeeding both of them it was just me her and a lack an lactation nurse in there teaching we were learning um well she was learning how to breastfeed too at one time and she kept saying she got hot, she was getting hot, and she passed out and threw up. And we pulled the cover back. And she was been complaining for a while. And I was trying to get more people to come in, and they just were not listening. She was in a pool of blood. She hemorrhaged. She lost seven units of blood. I believe they said her her size, the person her size probably only had about nine units of blood in them. Uh, they took her to the ICU and she got, ironically enough, my name is Bakari. She got what's called a Bakri balloon, which is a B-A-K-R-I balloon, which is expands in your uterus. It's a balloon that expands in your uterus to prevent bleeding. And she was in ICU for the first 36 hours of our children's life. And so that's number two. And number three was Sadie. Actually, we had an amazing, like I tell people, we had an amazing pregnancy, a terrible birth. And then Sadie was still a little jaundiced at about two months. And so we took her in and she got, she got diagnosed with biliary atresia, which is a very rare uh, bile disorder in your liver. And so by four months, she was in end stage liver failure. And she had a um, she had a, a liver transplant when she was eight months old um, in the month of September, uh, September 1st, actually, she got a transplant. And so those are the three I've learned about the disparities or inequities we have in our uh, transplant system. Uh, the fact that basically if you're poor, um, you really won't have access to the to, to transplants or the fact that only five percent of live donors in the country are black folk. I mean, I've been able to we've raised the I've been fortunate enough to raise millions of dollars for the American Liver Foundation and, and participate in things like that. So I've been able to see uh, many of the fundamental, uh, just terrible underpinnings of our 
healthcare delivery system from three different levels um, and and hopefully are able to you know analyze them and, and find some solutions in the in the future yeah yeah and it, as you mentioned just in your examples um you know ellen sellers serena williams you know even people who um you know cut across again socioeconomic uh, lines who we would expect to be able to navigate, but still encountering so many challenges uh, in the case of maternal mortality uh, and infant mortality, the disparity has also been persistent over time in ways that we have yet to be able to, uh, you know, to close. So it's an important area of work that continues uh, that we in the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan, uh, some of our sister schools, uh, you know, are, are addressing. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking about you as a father, uh, ex having these experiences. Uh, already, someone who um, shoulders a lot just in your own professional endeavors, uh, and you know, you've spoken out about your own mental health and living with anxiety. Um, and you know, it, it, not to use the examples of as the the key drivers, but why do you think it's important for leaders to be vocal? and honest about their own mental health challenges? And, you know, what have you learned from speaking about your anxiety more openly? Um, so, I mean, I, I I must say that that fundamentally it's about being an example. And for a long period of time, having any, and my parents are guilty of it too, but just not dealing with mental health in the black community is something that has been traumatizing. And we, we have many individuals who just, you know, have not gotten the, attention help that they deserved or needed in order to be a functioning member of society and um it, it's not a weakness it's not a it's not anything to be ashamed of but for far too long it's been treated as such and so i um my friend my good friend charlamagne the god who deals with mental health mental health and mental, mental illness all the time you know just talk about it because it, it it is what it is i mean it's a part of who i am it helps dictate my path i mean i go to therapy i mean I honestly don't go to therapy for my anxiety, although we deal with it a lot. I, I really go to therapy to deal with y'all who don't go to therapy. But that's, a whole nother, that's a whole nother story. Um, but I, you know, I've, I fundamentally believe in therapy. I think more black men need to do it just because of the trauma that we face when we, it's hard being unloved in this country and we're not a, a, a group of individuals who is um, necessarily loved. The stresses and pressures that, that, that uh, come along with just maturation i think all of us need to spend time on our mental health because if you're not mentally spiritually emotionally and physically healthy you're really not good for anybody your family or anybody outside of your home and so i fundamentally believe that we have to do a better job talking about it in ways that people understand meeting people where they are not being ashamed of it and then um getting treated yeah no absolutely and far too long there's just been stigma uh, about mental health and, um, you know, we've made, I think we're making progress, but, uh, you using your platform as a, as an example and serving as a model certainly, uh, you know, uh, helps to, to, to benefit us in reducing that stigma. And so one other issue that you've spoken on a lot is, uh, the issue of police violence. And it's something that we discuss in the school as well, because, you know, we regard police violence as a public health issue. Oh yeah, uh, and gun violence, police violence. Yeah, police violence, gun violence. They're all they they are all yes, the public health issues, and and we have to understand the underpinnings thereof. That's right. That's right. And dealing with, uh, you know, inequities uh, in that area, uh, black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people in the United States, just as as one example. And so. Uh, you know, there are a number of policy changes that we can make to address the issue. You stated, though, that, you know, even if we make all of these policy changes, we still need culture change uh, because yeah. this is uh, the issue in many ways links to, um, you know, cultural aspects of our country and systems of racism that are baked into our country and have been over centuries. Uh, culture change is hard and it, it takes time, but it's it's fundamental and critical work. And so what are some of the ways that you think we can help to change the culture when it comes to police violence? I mean, that's hard. I mean, I think the underpinning of the issue is that many individuals don't get the benefit of their humanity. Um, and so when you don't see someone as human, it's a lot easier to treat them as such, you know, treat I mean, 
you, I um, represent a young man named Ricky Cobb. Um, I represent his family. Unfortunately, Ricky is deceased. He was shot and killed in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and his officer was just charged yesterday uh, with three counts of, of murder, assault, and, and involuntary or, or incident, forget the, the term of art they use in, in Minnesota, but you see it often. And it's such a drain psycho psychologically and sociolo sociologically on your community, um, the family, and just that hole that having someone ripped away from you takes, um, or, or that hole that, that having someone taken from you gives you, um, is just, it's, it's very difficult. And so the solutions are policy driven, but it's also cultural. And, um, you know, just there are, um, there are segments of our population who view others as being less than. And I think fundamentally, I, I'm kind of think it's over in terms of that cultural change for, for, um, baby boomers and, and millennials. I think Gen Z, um, and my kids, we have to do a better job of just raising good humans. Absolutely. So, um, as noted in their introduction, you're an author. Um, yes. You've written books across different genres. And, and in 2022, you published a book uh, called Who Are Your People? And it's a children's book that teaches kids about uh, history of Black Americans. And so what, what inspired you to write the book? And what do you hope children learn from it? Yeah, no, nah, it's first of all, it's hard. It's hard, hard, hard to write a children's book because it's hard to break into the industry. There are not a lot of there are not a lot of children's book authors. I had to write a whole New York Times bestseller in order to write a children's book. And thank God that one actually did well. And it was a New York Times bestseller in its own right. So I was able to um, I was able to to um, do that well and get another opportunity with that. I'm working on another children's book now as we speak as well. So that was fun. Who are your people? I, I wrote it because of Sadie and Stokely. And when we were shopping for them before they were born and during their first few years of life, we realized that everything was like a blue or purple truck or, you know, something else. And I wanted them to be able to have images that reflected who they were. And I think representation is key. Um, you know, you can't tell a kid they can be a black lawyer if they've never seen one. You can't tell a kid they can be a Muslim doctor if they've never seen one. You can't tell a kid that they can be a, a, a Hispanic attorney um, if they've never seen one. And so for me, I wanted to be able to have that representation for uh, black black boys and girls around the world. And who are your people is it's a it's a saying that we use a lot in the South, like when we want to get to know somebody we're like, who are your people? I mean, we can tell a lot about who your people are like if you're if your cousin is the one who steals from church, like across town, we know we probably don't need to let you in our house. Right. But like if you come from good stock, as they say, then you can roll with me any day of the week. And so who are your people is a is a gauge of who the person is and and who they related to and what what y'all might be related, you know, their family or not, that, that type of. Got it. Got it. So and and you're also busy at work on a on a on another book or maybe just, uh, you know, waiting release. But uh, but a book called The Moment uh, yes. that will examine modern uh, the modern political landscape and policies that are impacting black families and communities. So uh, if you can take a moment to tell us about uh, the forthcoming book, The Moment. Yeah, it comes out April 23rd. It's a, it's a good book. It's different. Um, it's about 200 pages, a little bit shorter than than. Um, than, than my vanishing country, but it's a book about the racial reckoning that wasn't, you know, we all got in this moment in 2020. We're like, oh my God, we're here. We're about to do this thing. And we didn't. It was like a missed moment or a moment that never happened or one that was never really purposeful or, or in, intended to happen. Um, and so um, for me, it's, you know, we talked to good people like William Barber. We talked to Garland Gilchrist, my good friend Antoine Seawright. We talk about black men, their role in the community. We have a letter to my son, Stokely. Um, I, of course, there are a lot of tons of personal anecdotes. I always talk about my father's history and SNCC. I talk about um, I talk about gun violence, uh, state sanctioned violence and black on black crime, which is a fundamental myth. Um, I talk about all of these things in the con context of um, understanding the problem that we have. But this book is different in that it also gives you prescriptions for the future. Great. And so, you know, as you're providing, uh, you know, these helpful insights uh, to guide readers across ages, one of the things that we're unfortunately seeing playing out in recent years is 
legislation in certain states that aims to limit what teachers can teach in the classroom, yeah. uh, what books can be read, you know, particularly things that deal with topics such as race, racism, uh, and gender and, and, and sexuality. And, you know, these are important topics for anyone, for, you know, for any society. Uh, we regard them as really critical topics for public health, because again, if we want to improve health and well-being in communities, we need to understand that certain communities have been marginalized, underserved uh, in, in ways that will manifest in subsequent health issues. So, uh, so the trend is really disturbing. What are, what are some ways that you think we can combat uh, these trends and the movement uh, toward banning books uh, and the rise in this type of legislation? <clears throat> we just need more people running for office and more good people a part of the political process. I think that it's all, I mean, I also think the way we educate or miseducate um, uh, people in this country is also violent. I think it's a public health crisis. I think that there are direct health outcomes um, that you see tied to poverty, but also in communities where schools may not perform as well, um, where literacy rates are not as high. I mean, I, I, I'm not making that up. I don't think, Dean, you can tell me if I am. But I do think that 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 is the way we miseducate a lot of young people in this country. Um, it it it's violent and it's very it, it's very violent. Um, helps keep people in poverty, which drives other outcomes, crime, um, health, um, uh, and for me, um, I, I find that the anti intellectualism that we have in our communities right now is is is. It's just astounding. Um, and we know why that is, but we have to push back in a very meaningful way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as we we draw toward the net, the end of our time together, I'd like to ask just a, a closing question. You've, you've sure. given, you know, so many insights to the audience uh, at any stage and, and the audience consists of uh, student staff, faculty at the University of Michigan, but many external. But again, thinking about our students uh, who are uh, who will soon be taking their first steps into their careers as future public health leaders. I'm wondering what what final uh, advice you would give to them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I don't know if I have any advice per se, but be true to yourself. That's first and foremost. If you have to spend time finding out who you are, then do that. But be true to yourself. Take care of yourself. Um, again, if you're not mentally, physically, emotionally, um, and spiritually healthy, you're not good to anybody else. Uh, dream big and dream with your eyes open. Um, there's nothing that you really can't do. Um, love your neighbors, even when they don't love you, which I'm not there yet, but it's damn hard, but you gotta do that. I mean, that's a, that, that provides a level of, of, you know, not being inhibited by, uh, those emotions that, that drive people mad. Um, and then change the world. I mean, there, there's nothing that you can't do. Um, and I don't really have advice because I think that most times um, younger folk figure it out anyway. We just need to get out of the way. Absolutely. I think our public health students are up for the task. I think that's great advice. Yeah. Um, I'm inspired by every day. I'm inspired by our young people. Uh, the passion that they come in with, the talent, uh, the poise, and we're trying to do our best to uh, to train them to to provide a foundation uh, so that they can go out in the in the world and thrive and have the kind of impact that that is needed to address many of the challenges that that, that you discuss. So uh, we're just about the, uh, at the end of our time here for ahead of the curve. I'd again like to thank Bakari for taking the time to be here with us today and for sharing some of the really great insights about. Uh, his career and about leadership. Uh, Bakari, it was a fantastic conversation. I'm thankful for you being here. You started out by talking about your background uh, and noting that it takes a village to to uh, raise a child. And you know, you, as I think about you and as you described your village, um, you know that the other side of that is I know that you have made so many people and continue to make so many people immensely proud, right? You're the product of uh, dreams and prayers and hard work. So, um, you know, continue to do the great work that you're doing uh, and that, that benefits all of us. I appreciate you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And thank you. I mean, I'll end where I began, which is just to say thank you for 
uh, you know, for those of you all who uh, found it not robbery to be here, whether or not you're getting credit for this or not, thank you so much for for showing up, and and thank you, Dean, for uh, your your spirit is is calming and 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 dope. So thank you. Terrific, terrific. And for the audience, we will be making a recording of this available in a few places, including on our University of Michigan School of Public website. Uh, so please do visit. And we'll be making it available as a podcast. So I encourage you to check out our podcast and subscribe from wherever you listen to your, your podcast. So thank you again to Bakari and thanks to all of you for joining us. Be well, be safe and go blue. And because I know that our guest is heading headed to the South Carolina LSU uh, women's basketball game. I've never done this before, but go Gamecocks. There you go. That's, that's the first time for everything. Thank you, guys. Be blessed. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye.